Coming up on Doctype, form design. We're going to show you how to take the frustration out of web forms. Then, did you know you can write your own custom selectors in jQuery? We're going to show you how. So get ready to drop the shadows and round the corners because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by the Front End Design Conference and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that doesn't know the difference between JavaScript and a decaf latte. Or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding. Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. All right, so if you've been watching the tweets, you may have seen that Jim and I are going to work full time at Cursonified. Super happy to be part of the Carsonify team. But don't worry, Doctype is still going to be around, still doing uh, every Tuesday our latest tips, tricks, and tools. We're not going anywhere. Just moving on to work on with Carsonified, so even greater things to come. Yeah, super excited. Also, uh, last week, Steve Jobs posted a uh, letter or an open letter about his thoughts on Flash. Uh, to Apple.com, and he wasn't too kind to Adobe. Yeah, so it's starting to flare up the debate again about Flash and, you know, its future in the web and, you know, HTML5 and where it is now and if it's a, you know, a usable tool replacement for Flash or, you know, if Flash is relevant or will become irrelevant. It's interesting to see it sort of started the flame war again, but we'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Definitely. So uh, let us know in the, in the comments. This week, I'm going to be talking about form design, and Jim's going to show you how to write your own custom selectors in jQuery. Let's check it out. If you're not consuming content on the web, you're creating it, and most of the time, that comes in the form of a form. Web forms are a major part of any web experience, so we're going to show you how to make your next web form crazy awesome. When creating a form, you should of course label the form fields. You can use vertical labels or horizontal labels, and there are pros and cons to each. Vertical labels are most common. This is where the labels appear above the field that they're describing. These are best used when the data being collected is familiar to most users, and they don't really need to think much about what it is that they're inputting. This also increases speed because users only need to move their eyes down the page. The disadvantage to vertical labels is that the length of the page tends to increase. Horizontal labels labels are placed next to form fields, and they usually produce the most aesthetically pleasing results. They reduce the vertical space that's required, and the whole form generally fits more neatly into web applications because of the form's wider shape. However, horizontal labels can be tricky to get right and may even decrease usability. With left justified horizontal labels, the labels are very easy to scan down the page, but because they're not adjacent to the form fields, it can sometimes be confusing when trying to figure out which label corresponds to which form field. With right justified horizontal labels, it's very easy to see which label corresponds to which form field, but the downside is that the forms are more difficult to scan. In some cases, this can be exactly what you want if a form is requesting data Data that's less common, you may intentionally want to slow down your users so that they take a second to read what the form is asking for. In an ideal world, you should be able to take any sort of natural language input, like Tuesday afternoon or later today, for example, and transform it into the data format that you need it in. But that's not always possible. Instead, here are a few things you can do to make life easier on people that use your forms. A great way to avoid frustration is to provide your users with hints. When they focus on an input element, show a tooltip that helps them understand what they should be inputting, and perhaps an example value. Make sure that these are hidden most of the time, though, and that you only show a tooltip when it's needed. If you were to show all of these hints at once, your form might end up looking very cluttered and confusing. Sometimes, even with the help, a user might still type some unexpected input. When this happens, the best way to deal with it is to validate the form on the fly using JavaScript and tell the user before they submit the form. If real-time validation isn't an option, simply put up a friendly error message after they've submitted the form, and if at all possible, highlight the form field that they need to correct. Also, make sure you save their data when an error occurs. Nothing is more frustrating for a user than having to fill out a form all over again just because of a small error on one field. There's a lot more to learn about forms, so I'm sure we'll be revisiting this topic in a future episode. If you have any questions or comments, leave a comment below this video on doctype.tv or drop us a line at facebook.com slash doctype. When we come back, Jim is going to show us how to create custom selectors in jQuery.
If you're a web person, you're going to want to check out the Front End Design Conference. It's a one-day design conference in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida on July 22nd. There are seven amazing speakers that will be covering a wide range of front-end design topics. There's even a cool after-party and a whole weekend of mad geekery. Jim and I attended last year and it was a blast. Head on over to frontendconf.com and get your ticket. Early bird tickets are just $99 and only $129 later on. We hope to see you at the Front End Design Conference jQuery uses CSS selectors to find elements on the page, but did you know you can write your own pseudo-class selectors for jQuery? We're going to show you how. If you've used jQuery, you've probably seen the wide variety of selectors that are available to you. Besides the tag name, class, and ID selectors, there are also pseudo-class selectors, which are prefixed with a colon instead of a dot. And these are things like last child, even, odd, not, is, or has, and some of these can even take an argument to further define their behavior. Now a lot of these are straight out of the CSS specification, but we can even write our own. Our example is going to be a shortcut for looking up elements where the method attribute is post. Our pseudo selector will be called post. We start by wrapping our code in an anonymous function that will locally alias jQuery to the dollar variable and will keep our global namespace clean, just like we do for any other plugin. Then we create a function on the $.exprobjects objects colon property. The name we give our method will be the name of our pseudo class we use in our selectors, so in this example it's called post. The function we define will take four arguments. The first is an HTML node. Now this is not a jQuery object, but an actual element, so if you need to use jQuery on it, you must wrap in the jQuery function first. The second is the index. The selector engine works by taking a list of elements and passing each one of them to our custom function one by one. This index argument indicates which element in that list we are currently looking at. Next is the properties array, which will give us various segments of how our pseudo class was called. For instance, the second element will be the name of our pseudo selector, and the fourth will be the arguments we pass to our pseudo class, if any. The fourth is the full list of elements we are currently iterating over. In our example, we get the method attribute for our node. And if it exists, and it equals the string post, we return true to indicate that this matches our pseudo class. Otherwise, we return false to indicate that it does not. Custom pseudo classes can also take an argument, which allows the user to further customize how the selector will work. In our next example, we will create a pseudo class called twin, and this will take a selector string. It'll only match if the element matches the selector string and has one and only one direct sibling that matches that same selector. Again, we will create a function called twin on the colon property of the $.exprobjects object. Now we get the selector string that will be passed to twin by getting the properties arguments fourth item or index number three. We will also create a jQuery version of our node. We then return true if our node matches the selector and if it has exactly one sibling that matches that same selector. Now remember, your function will be called on a lot of elements, sometimes on every element on the page, so efficiency is important. You don't want to do things like Ajax calls or DOM manipulations or your page will slow down and become unusable. Just use the function to determine if the element matches and return as quickly as you can. Creating custom pseudo classes allows you to conveniently select things that wouldn't be possible using only CSS. So what kind of pseudo classes can you come up with? Let us know in the comments at doctype.tv. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you going to go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So, we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you going to use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's all for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe by itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype